Welcome to this lecture on linear models, part one regression. You might wonder why we are talking of linear models when the course is about deep learning. The idea is that we need to get a hold on basic concepts first before we jump into deep learning. So let's get started and we will be talking about linear supervised learning. Linear models provide approximate solution to many learning problems. The reason they are popular is because uh, they offer a very good analytical tractability. And uh, they also offer a good starting point for complex concepts. So that's the reason we are going to be talking about uh, these linear models before we jump into deep learning models. So let's start with a model that we call as a linear regression model. In this model, we assume that we are given a collection of d-dimensional vectors, we call them as training examples, and associated with every vector is a number y which is what we call as the target output or the desired output. The model takes the form of y hat equal to w0 plus w transpose x. y hat is the output that our model produces in response to the input vector x. W0 is a scalar quantity typically known as the bias. And W is a parameter vector typically known as the weight vector. And basically W0 plus weight vector W together form the parameters of the model. And the problem that this, uh, that we pose as a linear regression model problem is that we are given a collection of n pairs of examples. Every example consists of a vector xi and a scalar quantity yi. And what we need to do is we need to use these pairs of examples to find the parameters of the model. So question is how do we choose model parameters? The way we do it is by defining a cost function. And we find those parameter values that will provide a minimal or optimal value for the cost function. Generally, this minimization is done using some kind of search technique, for example, a gradient descent search technique. If you look at the cost function we have defined in this case, Basically, what we are saying here is that for an example i, the desired output or the target output is y sub i, and our model is going to be producing an output which is y hat sub i, and of course y hat sub i is given by uh, w0 plus w transpose x sub i. So basically, we take the difference between what we want and what the model is producing, take the square of the difference, add them up, add all those diff square differences over all the examples. And of course, we divide this sum by 2. That's just for mathematical convenience purposes. So that is our uh, criterion function in this particular case. As I said, this Minimization is typically done by some kind of search technique like a gradient search, but sometimes uh, you may want to use what we call as a closed form solution. So let's take a look at the closed form solution. So in matrix vector form, the linear regression model can be expressed as shown here. And the model parameters to minimize the least square error are determined by this expression uh, given for beta tilde. And the vector of predicted values can be then calculated using the expression shown here for y tilde. Uh, 
In some regression applications, we have multiple outputs. That is, we have uh, two or three or four scalar uh, values coming out as output. So in that case, output also is a vector of multiple values. And in such cases, the term multivariate regression is used. And in that case, the model will take the form as shown as the bottom of the slide. Oftentimes, it is very convenient to represent our situation, our modeling, in the form of what we call as a matrix vector representation. So let's take a look at matrix vector representation. So in this particular case, del Z by del W can be expressed as, if you look at the uh, final, uh, this thing, X transpose, y minus x multiplied with weight vector w. And if we set the partial derivative to 0, we can get a closed form solution. So the closed form solution in this particular case is shown as, as here, bounded in that box. And the matrix or the expression in the box is typically represented as x star, where x star is known as the pseudo-inverse matrix, because it's not a real inverse, but it is doing something very similar to what an inverse matrix will do. So that's why it's known as pseudo-inverse matrix. Now let's take a numeric example, simple example, following the pseudo-inverse approach, just to get a better understanding. And in this case, we are going to be predicting the number of credit cards. So the table here on the right shows a small part of a credit card database. Basically, we have the number of credit cards carried by a family. We have in the third column, or the second feature you can say, is the size of the family, whether the family has two members or three members or five members, and what is the income of the family and of course, income is in multiples of tens of thousands of dollars. So given this information, what we want to do is we want to build a model so that we can predict the number of credit cards a customer holds. And now you might wonder why you want to do that. Obviously, if you are running a company and, and you are in the credit card business, maybe you want to make an offer to a customer that you think is carrying fewer number of credit cards than what your model is suggesting. So let's say that our model is going to take this form, that is the predicted number of credit cards is going to be A0, which is again a parameter of the model, plus A1, which is again another parameter of the model multiplied with X1, where X1 is a variable representing the family size, plus A2, another unknown or another parameter multiplied with x2, where x2 is the family income. So this is how our model is going to look like. And what we want to do is, using the table that we have for fewer number of examples given, us, given to us, we can calculate what is the value of a0, what is the value of a1, and what is the value of a2. So to do that, let us uh, organize our training vectors or our input data in the form of a matrix. Let's call this matrix X. So this matrix is going to look like uh, as shown. It has three columns, and the number of rows is equal to the number of examples. And you will notice that the first column has an entry of one for all the rows. That is because what we are doing is we are augmenting the matrix by adding an extra column so that when we write mathematical expressions, do the manipulation, the first column will correspond to the bias term or A0. So you can say that the first column represents a feature whose value is always constant and is always 1. And that feature is going to to be multiplied by the bias term in our final prediction of the credit cards. Let's take the transpose of 
matrix X. So that's how the transpose is going to look like. Now we can multiply X transpose X. That will give us in this particular case a 3 by 3 matrix as we are seeing it. And then we can take the inverse of this. And that inverse also is going to be a 3 by 3 matrix. And once we have the inverse, we can go back to our expression for the pseudo inverse matrix and do the calculations. And in this particular case, our pseudo inverse X star is going to look like this. It is going to have three rows and the number of columns is going to be equal to the number of examples that we have. So with this information, what we can do is we can actually make the predictions. So basically, we can now plug in the pseudo inverse matrix and multiply it with our vector y, which is basically the actual number of credit cards carried by uh, families in our database. And based on that, we can calculate what is the value of a. So that a is going to be as shown here. So basically, we got three parameters of our model. First one is 0.48, second one is 0.63, and third one is 0.21. So first one is the bias term, and second one is A1, third one is A2. So with these three parameters, now we can calculate or we can predict how many credit cards our families will be carrying given the size of the family and, and their income. So y hat vector comes out to be as shown. Now you can compare this y hat vector with vector y, and you can see that uh, there are some differences, which of course is expected. But what we are doing is we are able to make some kind of a reasonable prediction for the number of credit cards these families are carrying. Now you might wonder why, you know, we have a closed form approach, seems to be a reasonably good approach. So why not uh, we use this approach all the time? So you might wonder why this approach is not suitable for large size problems. And if you think about it, you will realize that for large size problems, the size of the matrices is going to be going to be very large. So wherever you have to take the inverse, you will run into issues and you'll not be able to calculate those inverses without some kind of search or approximation techniques. So that will take you back to gradient search or some other suitable search, even if you were to apply this approach for large size problems. So that's why this approach is good for small size problems, but not for large size problems. Let's look at another example of uh, closed form solution. And in this case, we are going to be using a function from uh, one of the Python libraries called LSTSQ, that is least square estimation. And the code is pretty small as shown here. So basically, given the wind speed and the number of occupants in a house, we are trying to estimate what is the energy need. And for that, we are given uh, four examples. And basically, using these four examples, we are building a model. And basically, the model parameters and predicted values are shown here at the end of the, the code. Now, you, one thing you have to worry about all the time is that, you know, OK, you created a model. So how good is the model? So, this is known as what we call as assessing model goodness. So in this case, what we can do is we can assess the goodness of a model by looking at residuals. These residuals, that is the difference between what you are getting and what you expected, that difference or residuals should show some of these properties. That is, the values of the residuals should be randomly distributed, the variance should be constant, and the distribution should be normal in nature. So typically, if you do a residual plot, this is how it should look like. One can also assess the goodness of a model in terms of what is known as the coefficient of determination. 
and the coefficient of determination is defined as a ratio of SSR, which stands for sum of squares, to the ratio of SST, which is sum of squares of totals. The two definitions for SSR and SST are given here, and generally a value of R square if it is close to 1, is considered a good value. All right. Uh, the idea of gradient descent is pretty simple. Suppose we want to minimize the function f of x. To do that using gradient descent, what we'll do is we'll pick some arbitrary starting value for x. And then at that location of x, we will calculate the value of the gradient of the function at that location. And using that gradient, we will basically get an updated value for x. And that updating will be done using this particular equation. And once we have done the updating, we will calculate the gradient value at the new location for x and repeat the process. And we'll continue doing this till we come up to a point where we feel that no more updating is necessary. And at that point, we will stop the process. So this is basically a very simple gradient descent approach, which is very popular. And if you want to read more about it, look at some examples. There is a link here. You can take a look at that. Of course, uh, when you are working with uh, functions that have several variables, obviously then when you calculate partial derivatives, those are directional derivatives. They basically give you derivative information along different axes. So if you are working with a two-dimensional function, function f of x and y, then you will have del f by del y and you will have del f by del x, two partial derivatives. And in an example here, we have shown how the function f of two variables x, y, which has a form cosine 1 upon 2x times cosine 1 upon 2y multiplied with x is going to look like in the x, y space. And at some point, uh, we are showing here what is the value of these gradients. Uh, these partial derivatives in, in, in x and y directions. So in this case, you will notice that the gradient is a vector because it has two components, one along x-axis and one along y-axis. On the other hand, if you are working with an n-dimensional function, the gradient will have n components and you will have a gradient as an n-component vector. Another interesting property related to gradients is that a gradient at a point defines a hyperplane that approximates the function in the neighborhood of that point. And of course, the neighborhood is supposed to be really, really small. So the approximation is given by this expression del z equal to del f by del x times delta x plus del f by del y times delta y. What we'll do now is we'll take a look at a very simple minimization example. First, we will perform the minimization using the traditional approach, that is take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for the solution. And then we will take a look at it using the gradient descent approach. So in this case, let's look at a function f of three variables, x1, x2, x3. The form of the function is shown here in the slide. And what we need to do is, first we need to find the de partial derivatives of this function with respect to x1, x2, x3. And once you get them and arrange them in the form of a vector, basically what you have is the gradient vector for this function f. Now what we'll do is we'll set the gradient equal to zero. That basically gives us three equations with three unknowns, and we can solve them because these are linear equations. 
So if we solve them, basically we get a solution for our x1, x2, x3 values that minimize the function. And the solution turns out to be that x1, x2, x3, they all have to be identically equal to minus 1. And that is when the function gives us the lowest possible value. Let's uh, do this using the gradient descent approach. So in this case, uh, again, uh, we have the gradient vector which we calculated earlier. Let's pick a starting point, x0 as all zeros. So that becomes our starting point. And then what we'll do is we'll calculate the value or the components of the gradient vector at this starting point. So if we plug in the x1, x2, x3 values all equal to 0 in our uh, gradient uh, vector expression. And we get the result that the gradient vector at that particular position has components 1, 0, 1. So with this gradient vector, we can find the updated value for x. Let's call that updated value x1. So x1 is given by the equation as shown in there. If you assume alpha to be 0.5, typically it's a small number, less than 1. So with alpha equal to 0.5, the updated value for x1 turns out to be minus 0 0.50 minus 0.5. Let's use this now x1 value to get the x2 value. Again, the process will be identical. So basically, if we do these steps, x2 turns out to be uh, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5. And if we continue on with this process, you'll find that x5, the updated value after fifth correction, turns out to be minus 1091 divided by 1168 minus 66 divided by 73 and minus 1091 divided by 1168. So you can see that all these three numbers are almost equal to 1. So basically, we have our solution at this point. Now let's uh, look at the illustration of gradient descent search for linear regression using a very simple example in two dimensions. Basically, we are given a collection of examples. Each example consists of the size of a house, which is given in terms of the square feet, and the price of the house in thousands of dollars. So what we want to do is we want to perform linear regression, or we want to build a simple linear model that relates size with the price of the house. And we will do this using gradient search. So in the left-hand panel, you can see blue line, which is our starting point, or you can say that's our current hypothesis. And in the right-hand panel, we are showing you a plot of contours representing cost function at different heights. So the innermost contour is at the lowest height or with the lowest value, and outermost contours are at higher values. And the red mark on a contour indicates where our current solution is in the parameter space, which happens to be a two parameter space, you can call them as theta 0 and theta 1, or you can call them as A0, A1, or W0, W1. Either way, it's fine, all right? So with this, we start applying gradient search. So basically, after first step, the line has moved a little bit, and you can see in the right-hand panel, the new location of our solution is shown in terms of uh, where it lies on those contours. We can do one more step, and in this case, again, you can see that the line has moved further. And similarly, in the right-hand panel, we have a new location for our solution point. And we can keep doing this, and you'll find that we keep getting solution uh, modifications or changes to our uh, solution vector.
and one more and at this point you can say all right we have landed at the lowest point in our contour space there and in the left hand side panel we have the current uh, model for our regression equation which is basically a line in this case relating the size of the houses and the prices so that's basically that's all it's to uh, gradient search using in this particular case now let's get back to modeling and let's go back to those equations so if you look at the top equation here that is basically the same equation i had shown you earlier and you can calculate what is the partial derivative so del z divide uh, del z by del w0 that's the equation on the right hand side and del z by del w is another expression on the right hand side remember we basically talked about uh, having an additional column of all ones when we looked at the pseudo inverse the same idea can be applied here and generally is applied when we are working with equations so the idea is that if we can add an extra one to x vector that is if we augment all of our training vectors with an additional one either at the beginning or at the end what we can do is we can absorb this term w0 in our weight vector so with that done we can say that our new expression for cost function is as shown here and its par partial derivative can be written like this so with that one can talk of what we call as batch gradient descent that is if you calculate the partial derivative and sum it up over all examples that you have then basically you are looking at what we call as the batch gradient that is you have taken the entire batch of training examples and you have calculated the value of the gradient so we can take that batch gradient value and then apply that to calculate the new weight vector value using the formula as shown here w new is w old plus alpha times uh, gradient at old position now let's look at what we call as lms rule least mean square rule this is also known as widrow half rule so in this case we think of updating our solution after every training example that is instead of calculating the gradient vector over all the examples what we do is we take an example calculate the gradient vector make the correction take next example calculate the gradient vector make the correction and so on so if we follow that approach that is a single example and doing the correction after every single example we can write our updating rule as shown over here so in this case w new is w old plus alpha times y sub i which is the desired output for the ith example minus w transpose old x sub i which is the output of the model for example x i with the current uh, parameter values and the multi and this expression multiplied further by x sub i so this rule is known as the lms rule or the widrow half rule here is an example of applying widrow half rule in this case the idea is to predict the power output of a plant based on certain historical readings so in this case the data is given in excel file so first thing we do is we read the data and essentially we have five variables that are involved here so what one can do is one can perform some correlation analysis to see what is the relationship between these five variables and that is what has been done over here 
Next, what one can do is one can basically look at the relationship between the different variables and the output. So the different uh, variables, in this case, the input variables or the independent variables as they are called, are temperature, exhaust volume, ambient pressure, and relative humidity. And output is what's the uh, power plant output. So typically, although you don't really need to do this step to build your regression model, but it is always advisable because what this or similar steps do is that they give you an idea of what is the relationship between different variables and their relationship with the output. And in this case, what we'll do is we'll divide the data into training and test sets because what we like to do is we'll like to use a subset of examples to build our model and then we will use a set of a subset of examples called test set to see how good is our model on examples that the model hasn't seen so basically what we are doing here is we are splitting the data into training and test sets and then in this particular case from the sk learn library we can import the linear regression model and perform the fitting. So if you look at uh, the coefficients of the models, those are shown over here. And you can see that there are four independent variables. So these are the four coefficients that you have here. And of course, the coefficient or the parameter corresponding to your bias term is typically called intercept. So that is what you have and MSE basically is the mean square error that your model is producing after it has fitted the data. One can calculate what is the R square coefficient or regression score and in this case that is close 0 0.9365 etc etc which means our uh, model is pretty good. Remember I said uh, this, the coefficient, if it is close to one, is indicative of uh, good model fitting. So basically, uh, we have a model that basically is showing pretty good relationship. And here is, at the bottom, is a plot which basically plots the predicted values as well as the test y, y test values and y predicted values. And more or less these values should be lying along a line around 45 degrees and that's more or less what we are seeing. Now let's talk about what we call as stochastic gradient descent or SGD. I'm sure many of you already come across this term. The idea is that if you look at the batch mode, uh, the batch mode works pretty fine as long as the training data is relatively of a small size. If you're thinking of training examples running into thousands and thousands, obviously batch mode is not a good idea because uh, you have to go through all the examples first, then you do uh, store all the intermediate results and then you make changes and so on. On the other extreme, if you want to use the single example correction, again, that's not computationally efficient. So there is a compromise between the batch mode and the single example mode. And that compromise is basically saying that why not we use mini batches, that is batches of small sizes, like 50 examples or 10 examples or 100 examples, depending on the problem. And when you do gradient descent using these mini batches, in that case, the process is known as stochastic gradient descent. Now, strictly speaking, the term used to imply mini batch of one example only, but currently in popular literature, SGD implies batches of a small size, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and so on. All right, so we will stop here at this point, and in the next lecture, we will talk about linear models for doing classification. So let's uh, stop here.
All right.